Well, last week we, st we, we talked about capacity given can be lost, and that capacity lost can be redeemed. Uh, capacity given can be lost, and capacity lost can be redeemed. Uh, we, uh, we talked um, um, and said God gave men full and delegated capacity, matching the capacity he had created when he created everything. Now, before I even go into that recap, something was in my spirit this morning as I was praying and really preparing for this. God just, uh, when we talk about um, 2020 will make the turn, I want to keep encouraging you because it's a prophetic positioning, and please keep claiming your place and your turn. Uh, don't wait for somebody's turn and say, ah, oh, let me turn with you. Uh, because it happened when people just turn and you turn with them, you're not, that's not your turn, it's their turn. So don't, don't just follow, but be the, the one that marks your own turn. And some of you have already begun the turn. Um, and so don't wait uh, for a full uh, lecture on this or a full teaching on this. Begin to walk in that, uh, in that direction. Um, Abraham made the turn. Uh, not when he left heir of the Chaldeans. The heir of the Chaldeans, God spoke to them and he said, look, leave your country, leave your home. Go to the place that I promised and I'll bless you. And um, when he spoke to Abraham, uh, he only spoke to Abraham. He didn't speak to the family. He didn't speak to Terah. He didn't speak to Lot. He didn't speak to Abraham's brother. But Abraham shared what God had said. But guess who took the leadership to leave heir of the Chaldeans? It wasn't Abraham. Now let's read scripture here. Uh, Acts chapter 7 verse 2 to 4 says, And he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Very clear. Now you read that in, uh, in Genesis 12, but the explanation is in Genesis chapter 11. Because in Genesis chapter 12 it says, God had said, which means that God said before. Um, so, um, and then the, the glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. Now, let's flip back and go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 30. And he says, but Sarai was barren. <laughs> I like how it all starts. It says, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son, Abraham, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. I want you, this is just to help you so that you keep focused, that you make the turn. Um, what happens here is God speaks to Abraham. I want to fit in and, and I want to just use uh, preacher's license. I believe that Abraham shared the same with his family, with his dad. And he says, this is what God has said to me. But guess what happens? It is terror who then takes the family. He says, now let's, what did God say? I will take you there. Uh, let me just add a little bit and add my own little and say, look, well, I, I, I'm not sure whether you understand. Let me just make sure that I still... Uh, and guess what happened when they did that? They went into the opposite direction. And Terah was in lead. He was leading the pack. Abraham followed because God had spoken. Terah led because he heard from Abraham that God had spoken. So they went. And they go to Haran. Now, <laughs> something had to happen for Abraham to make the turn. 
It didn't take a negotiation with his father to say, look, dad, I don't think we're going in the right direction. But it had to take terror to die. So that Abraham takes over and leads and takes the turn at Haran. That's when they take the turn to go to Israel or to go to uh, the land of Canaan. Even though God had spoken to Abraham, his father Terah took the lead and took them in the wrong direction. With all good intentions, saints, we tend to trust our destiny in people who are sincerely wrong. With all good intentions. We're not talking about these are devils. These are people who are malicious. They want to derail us. Because we are not constantly hearing God, we can have the tendency of trusting our destiny where God wants to take us to, to people who are sincerely wrong. But they're in the wrong direction. I have realized in the recent past, and even before, that some people are sincere, but sincerely wrong. And I'm beginning to question that what part of my destiny do they hold? So if they hold a part of my destiny, I would rather not put my destiny in their hands or in their control. So that I will be able to move into the direction that God wants me to go. Let me tell you, this could be family members. This is Abraham's father, Terah. This could be brothers and sisters. This could be folk in church. This could be your pastor in church. <laughs> this could be me. <laughs> I could be sincerely wrong in directing you in a direction that you'll be going and you realize that no, God actually wants me to go in that direction. This could be your community leaders, your chiefs, Mambo Ati. Sincerely wrong. This could be the, 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 the government, the president and his cabinet, they could be sincerely wrong. And, and we put our, our trust and we end up putting our trust in the pastor, in the leader, in your chief executive, in the president, in the minister. But they could be sincerely wrong. So I am calling you to a higher calling of hearing from God for yourself. You need to hear from God for yourself so that your destiny is not dictated by people who are sincerely wrong. I am saying these are not evil people. They actually love you and like you. They want to bless you even. They have got good intentions for you. But good intentions alone in the Lord is not good enough. The word of God to you is what is good enough for you, not the good intentions. Not even good motives are good. But let me tell you, the word of God is what is good for you and nothing else. You could surround yourself with people who have good intentions, good motives and everything else, but sincerely wrong. You need to hear from God. I needed to say that very clearly because there's some of you here who are just waiting to be told by someone. And then you follow. So, Tara was told, we got to leave. And Tara said, okay, you got to leave, but I got to take the lead. Sincerely wrong. So, he leads. Goes in the wrong direction. He had to die before Abraham realizes, I got to go. I got to go in the right direction. I got to hear God. He started hearing God. And his, his GPS began to say, you were going in the wrong direction. You know that woman, uh, sometimes he's a male. So when, when you're d doing the, 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 what do you call it, the Google Maps and so on, there's, there's always a navigation. There's always a woman, 10 left. Uh, sometimes, you know, I was driving in Cape Town. <laughs> and then they say, look, in the next 100 meters, 10 left. So I missed that. It says, 10 left, 10 left. I said, I switched it off. I said, you can't continue commanding me. I'll find another way of finding my left. So some of you are just waiting for somebody. Next 100 meters, 10 left. No. That compass, that instruction should not be coming from a human being. That instruction should be coming through the word of God. That you must be. And it doesn't come by just lounging and uh, sitting there. It comes through prayer. 
we are, we, are, we are lifting the standard of prayer in this church. To say prayer, we, whether you are going to say I'm coming for prayer meetings, or if you're not praying, it's going to be impossible to hear God. Because how else are you going to hear God if it is not through the avenue of prayer? So you need to hear God. You need to submit whatever you're feeling, hearing, understanding, the situations you're going through. Submit them to so that you hear the voice of God. That must be confirmed with a biblical pattern of his Logos word. God must speak to you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So anyway, so God gave men fully a full delegated authority, matching the capacity he had created. So God didn't say, look, I'm just plunging you into this. But yeah, you need to work hard. No. He gave full delegated authority. And he says, I've created everything. I've just put everything in place. But I've also given you the full measure of capacity to control everything. So, the capacity that God had created, he meshed the same capacity in Adam and Eve. And stay with me there, because it's important when we take territory that we do not feel deficient with the territory that God has given us. And this is how the enemy, the devil, lies to you that, ah, you might get, because the world works in pass rates. Remember, so pass mark 51% were pass and did. But you really just made it. Let me tell you, when God gives you the capacity, it's 100%. It's not 99%. So it means he gives you the equal capacity to dominate, to have dominion, to procreate, to be able to exercise full authority that is from on high. Without any gaps showing that, oh, I wish we could have done a little bit. Almost God says, yeah, I'd given you, but I had not anticipated the following to happen. He gives you, you just have to walk into it. So God gave men the full delegated capacity and uh, matching what he had created. So when God gives you that territory, he gives you the equal capacity. If God calls you to be the president of Zimbabwe, and it is, if it is God who has said that, let me tell you, he gives you everything. Yes. The problem is when God calls you to something else and then you become the other thing. And God says, this is mismatched. God calls you to be the pastor of this church and then you go and become uh, the, the, um, the pastor of another church then there's a mismatch or go and do something that is totally different. God says, no, I've called you to this. Because for Abraham, he also gave him the full capacity to enjoy what he had created for him. And for Adam and Eve, it was, it was 100%. For that, God gave man unfettered will. Unfettered will. Which means that... So there will be no limitations to choose. So when God gave that, he says, Look, I'm giving you the will to choose. You can choose anything. You can do anything you want. It's unfettered. Let me even say that even God himself will not limit it. So God gave the unfettered will and he says, even myself, I can't withhold it from you. I cannot come and say, yeah, because we're Farisa, I'm just, I'm just going to limit your will now. It didn't. It was unfettered will. That meant that you could, Adam and Eve could do anything that they wished to do. Now, stay with me. Because it is helping us that that which was lost can be found. Because we lost it, by the way. We lost that capacity. Full rights is what God gave. Gave full rights so that they have full freedom. Full rights. There was no one. You know, we call about the global human rights, whatever. They, they actually fall short to what God gave these guys. Full rights. Why the full rights? Is because God wanted them to enjoy un, unlimited freedom. Unchecked freedom. 
No one would take their freedom to be what they wanted to be. Not even God himself would take their freedom. Talking about delegated and what they had. And then he gave them an abundant life. So they have power to dominate, to have dominion on everything created to eternity. Which meant that when, Abraham, when Adam and Eve were created, there was no death sentence. They couldn't die. They, 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 they wouldn't die. Which meant that <laughs> today, if they had not messed up, today they will be here <laughs> with us. Not even getting old. Because that came with sin. Take and go find out. We're going to grow up. One big happy family. Can you imagine? All that. They couldn't die. So that they have power and dominion. Also because they would, not, they, they would not have fear of death. Now when you want to have dominion, the only thing that stops you from having dominion is the fear of death. So what you going to find is So if you want to dominate a certain territory, there's always, ah, be careful, be careful. Be careful, ah, there are devils. There's always a threat to your life. So, so when, when Adam and Eve were created, there was no threat to their lives. There was only one tree. In the middle of the garden. That was the thing. They said, look, don't do anything to this thing here. But otherwise, carry on with whatever you need to do. Because God had given them the will and the full freedom. Even the tree was still subject to Adam and Eve. So he didn't make it impossible for them not to choose. And that is where the mark of a full capacity is. And then they would not live in fear or death. And nothing will kill them. Not even God himself would kill them. Okay. Then, men lost their capacity. Willingly. Now, let me just say that this is where we need to understand. So when you lose your capacity, um, <laughs> uh, there's an accident. So there's processes. You can have an accident. Uh, you can have an attack. But even when you have an accident and then have an attack, it is up to you to say, look, am I going to follow the consequences of what this has done to me? You've seen some of these amazing testimonies of people who have an accident. They have, uh, um, you know, their legs are cut off, but they come back to life even much more powerful because they've refused to look down on their inability or their disabilities or, or whatever has, they've suffered and they move to another level. Now, I was talking this week with a nephew of mine and I said, look, you know, when you fail, when you have an accident, or when you have a disaster, never look at it as failure. Because failure is a condition that you then absorb into your life. But you can fail, you can have a mistake, you can, uh, you can do all sorts of bad things. But the best way of reflecting on it is to say this is a point of learning. So when you fail, Make it a point of learning so that the failure does not become your condition. So there are no failures in God, but we fail. But when we fail, we learn. So if you keep saying, I'm a failure, and I'm talking to those who didn't make it. There are some, some people here who didn't make it uh, for, for A-levels, O-levels. Uh, by the way, congratulations. I think the O-level results were out. Um, congratulations for those who, who passed. Uh, but let me just speak to those who, who felt that they didn't um, meet the mark. That's a learning place. That's a learning place. It's not a failure place. Do not don yourself. Do not clothe yourself with that say, look, but I'm a failure. You might have failed, 
but you have learned. There's many times I've failed in my life. Exams, I've failed a lot. Um, I was giving my own nephew the many times I've failed exams. There are certain things that I do very well today, but I just scraped with a 51% um, after actually repeating. But today, I could now be seen as a fundi and as an expert because I did not try and put on the, the, the clothing that says, but you're not so... Yes, you're not so good. Because these are man-made uh, processes. But what I seek is a God-ordained path that says, what, I, what have you called me to do? Because this same God specializes in weaknesses. He specializes in weak things and turns them around and makes them for his own glory and that you become a success yourself. So in this way, the, 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 the men willingly failed, willingly submitted. So the, he lost his capacity, willingly. God didn't say, look, oh, there was no attack of the devil that, oh, no, now it has happened. So here's what I'm, Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, in a cunning way. Now, you always think that the devil comes, you know, with horns and, you know, screaming and making funny faces at you. He doesn't. He actually comes, and the Bible says, clothed as the uh, prince of light. So he comes in in this way and he says, uh, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The lie of the devil. Now, earlier on, I've already told you that God gave man full capacity. It's delegated authority. He gave them the will, the rights, the freedom, and the life. Now, what more would men want? But the devil comes cunningly and says, you shall be like him. So if Eve and Adam were there to respond back to the serpent, he would have said, by the way, we are already like him. End of story. We're already like him. So I don't know what you're talking about, that we eat will be like him. No, we're already like him because we create with him. We do the things. We dominate the way he does. He has given us everything we need. We're already like him. We are his He's delegated authority here. And he, is, he has not taken away anything from us. He has asked us to manage, to dominate, to have power, to have dominion. We are like him. But guess what? Because God did not take away the will from Adam and Eve, did not take away the rights and the freedom from Adam and Eve, did not take away their life, here's what the woman then slips into. So... The, so, when the woman, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, ha, you know, suddenly, 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 the tree looks good. Have you been in that situation? Suddenly, the thing that God blessed you with is no longer beautiful. But something else is more beautiful. Suddenly, your spouse doesn't look that beautiful anymore. Then you say, Yeah, I was cheated. 
the truth was never given to why was I, why wasn't I given the full choice before? Suddenly. So the woman saw. And the tree was desirable, good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. <laughs> These people were given full authority. Full, 100%. Nothing withdrawn from God. Will, rights, life, everything was given. And suddenly they start seeing something better in a tree. They start saying, wow, this could give me wisdom. As if they lacked wisdom. As if they lacked anything good. As if they lacked power. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her. And he ate. So the guilty one is Adam. So I know that at this point we could have now another theological argument, but yes, because the Bible also says that it was Eve who was tempted. But let me just tell you, the responsibility fell on Adam because he was the last accountable person. He should have said, we stop right there. We're not eating this tree. God did not say we, God did say we must not eat. And therefore, we cannot eat. So the moment they had taken that fruit, Adam should have said, throw that fruit to the ground. We're not eating. But he said, yeah, having listened to you, my wife, you are right. Women, be very careful what you tell your husbands. They do listen. (laughs) I hear somebody out there says, uh, Pastor, not mine. Mine doesn't listen to me. They do listen. They might not tell you that they've listened, but they do. Adam and Eve were willing participants in the loss of capacity. Friends, we are willing participants in the loss of capacity. It is not hijacked. It is not stolen from us. We are willing participants. We lose capacity because we want to. We express our will to lose that capacity. Some of us lose our capacity because we're not reading anymore. We're not exercising anymore. We're not doing this anymore. We we willingly, it doesn't matter whether you think that, well, I have a condition. No, there are ways to make sure that God God has given you creativity. Go right around all the hindrances because God has given you full capacity. So you willingly lose your own capacity. You, you, You are not forced into it. These guys willingly submitted uh, to the serpent. And um, they exercised their full will because they chose. They exercised their full rights. They were free. They actually exercised their full life. They lost their life in the process, in God. At the moment, they lost their will, their rights, and their life in God. Three things they lost there. And they lost their capacity. Stay with me. Because I'm trying to teach carefully. So that you understand the part you play in creating capacity. And the part you play in losing capacity. It is in those three areas. Now the world has been engulfed in free domes and so on and so forth. The church has been forced to react. uh, To be uh, activists. To try and defend the cause of the gospel. Let me tell you that you are never going to win the war by legislating truth. You won't even win the war by declaring Zimbabwe a Christian nation and use the Bible to guide everything. There's nothing like that. Because you cannot legislate sinners by the word of God. The journey that you and I have to make is to bring everybody from lostness of capacity to new life in Christ so that they exercise the full will, full rights, and full life in Christ knowing that they are limitless, but they're now doing it in God. But if you legislate it, we have had wars in this country. Uh, Activism, 
right now, let me tell you, there is a, there is a drive to legislate um, abortion. They are people who are up in arms. We cannot do this. Rightfully so. But I'm telling you, you will not win the war by legislating because abortions are growing every day. Even when you legislate that abortions are, are, are illegal. You know, when you put the law too much, when you legislate, the law <laughs> takes away life. The spirit is the one that gives life. I'm not saying that we must uh, allow evil things to prevail whilst we watch. I am just saying it is not the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is for people to find their maker who will give them their full will, full rights, and full life. But if we legislate things, in this church we could get up and start saying, well, we want a certain behavior. That behavior is the one that brings the Holy Spirit. So maybe when I walk down here, everyone stands up and starts clapping and screaming. The Holy Spirit then comes down. You are legislating a process and God is not confined to that. You need to, to get locked back into the will of God, the rights that God gives you in the life that God gives you. And that's what I'm, I'm trying. This is where we find our capacity. And we must go beyond what man creates, what man, what the, the traditions of man. We must go beyond the, uh, the, the, the habits of man. We must get into the truth that God has spoken right at the beginning. Because that's what the serpent questions. The serpent questions what had become a habit. And he says, did God really say this? And guess what? Every habit, every tradition can be questioned and can be changed. What you want is the truth that cannot be changed. So they lost that. Willingly. It becomes a slippery slope. When you lose your will, when you lose your rights, when you lose your life, it's a slippery slope. Let's go, go back to the scriptures again. Let me just say this. When innocence is lost, because they... They, they, these guys lose their innocence. When innocence is the basis for trust. So if you see me and I see you, I, I have no reason to think that you are up to no good. So there is, a, there is an innocence covering around you that there is actually nothing that I'm aware of that you've done that is wrong, that is going to injure me. So innocence is lost. Because innocence is the basis for trust. And trust is the basis for any relationship. Now, I want to make sure I go deeper here. It's because many of us just think that love is the basis for a relationship. No. For a relationship, trust is the basis. You lose trust, you will not continue in that relationship. Whether it's a family relationship, it's a love relationship, it's a work relationship, whatever it is, once trust is lost... Because you judge the other person not to be innocent anymore. So there is a need to always retain our innocence in our relationship by confessing our sins, our shortcomings, our intentions and our motives one to another so that we can walk in the light. And that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that we are reconnected. So Adam and Eve lose their innocence. People always think that love keeps that relationship together. It's not. Trust keeps the relationship together. Love is commanded. Trust is earned. Let me say that again. Love is commanded. What did God say? He says, love your enemies. Which means... <laughs> But he didn't say, trust your enemies. He says, love your enemies. So love is actually commanded to the people that you hate most. God actually says, don't hate them. Go and love them. But he didn't say, go and now start having been cozy with them. You know, don't worry. They will not hurt you. No. He said, love them. 
But trust is end. It is end with a journey where you're creating an innocent environment between you and the other person, and then trust is built. I want to just encourage us that when trust is lost, capacity is lost. So whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a work situation, whether it's in us in church, when we lose trust with each other, we lose capacity. It's slippery slope. So do everything you need to do to regain trust because territory is actually relational. It's not transactional. So you need to relate with people so that they can trust you. We said authority is given and not taken, which means the people you relate with, they must trust you so that they give you authority to operate, license to operate. So if they don't give you that authority, guess what? Trust when it's lost, capacity is lost. You can give yourself as many titles. You can tell them that you've been to heaven and back, but they don't trust you. You can even turn uh, water into wine uh, for whatever reason. But let me just tell you, they still won't trust you. And therefore, the territory that you are trying to take, which they occupy, will never be yours. Do everything you can to win over trust. Do everything you, so that you retain your innocence. Now, there will also be times when people do not know the truth around you and they will always think and feel. You know how people are in this converged global, they will always, association becomes like, ah, uyu munu, ah, no, I don't trust. What are you nani? What are you who nani? Whose friends, who do they work with? We already have name tags for these sort of people. We stereotype them. But over a period of time, People will know the truth and that truth will set them free. Do whatever you can to make sure you walk innocently but circumspectly, knowing that the days are evil. Amen? Let's keep going. So Adam and Eve lost their innocence and trust between them and God was lost. Why? It actually was reflected by them first. Then the eyes of both were opened. <laughs> Let me just go a little bit more there. The eyes were opened. Whenever innocence is lost, you become very suspicious of everything. You, 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 you are very... Message coming down, 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 your eyes are opened and you become more suspicious. Let me tell you, that suspicion actually grows into superstition. A lot of people become superstitious, not just suspicious. Superstitious. Have you ever heard those people? I dreamt. I dreamt. It's because... Because you, you develop this suspicion over a period of time. And I, one day we'll, we'll, we'll walk through about dreams, by the way. There are dreams from your flesh, dreams from God, and dreams from the devil. So because you are suspicious or you are <laughs> you're suspecting that there's something wrong, in your dreams, guess what happens? You begin to be suspicious. So you dream. And most people who walk in the superstitious world don't trust anything. Even when you put on a different type of gown, they'll say, yeah, why? Why really? 
There is something there that is wrong. I, I just sense, I just sense, if you ever met those people, I just sense, I just sense there's something. Anyway, I just sense there's something. There's something there. Do, do, do you see it? No! Because innocence has been lost. You've become suspecting, but you've become superstitious. Not suspicious, but superstitious. Everything is a demon around people. We are never Everything, even the good things, they become demonic. Five. Ah, very anti modern materialism. No, God has just blessed me. Come on. And I'm not in Zimbangan. I materialism. Hmm. And I'm not Gani. And I'm not Gani. So there is not. Now, can you see how you limit your territory and your capacity? Because you approach the whole world with superstition, there is no one you can influence anymore. Jesus didn't do that. He would walk around and he knew that we actually did 10 years away, but kept them in. This one would deny me. He kept them in because it was part of his mandate to say, I take full authority over all this. The group that came for food, he knew that they would run away at, the, at just the, hey, we want to kill this. They'll say, oh, we don't know him. We are leaving him. But he knew all that. But guess what? He kept his influence intact and he didn't become... He wasn't even suspicious. He knew. He wasn't even suspecting. He knew their intentions. The Bible continues says he knew their intentions. But he didn't stop speaking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He didn't. Now, no. Don't go and see. Uh, and now this is where some preachers, I, I, I really wish that we could go through this with pastors across. Some preacher says, do not go and see your father-in-law. I can see that he is holding something in his hand, and uh, no. now I want to see all this. No one has ever, I don't want anybody to tell me that you can't see this relative because they're going to kill you. I'll go there. Because you're limiting my territory by now making me not go and see those people. You must go and see the mother in law and the father in law. Please go and see them. Even if you think, go and see them. Go and bless them. Yes. Because it's part of your territory. Don't go there and say, hey, hey, hey. Oh, go there and dominate, have dominion. Yes. You child of God, yes, you are. So intimacy with God is lost. And the, their eyes were opened. And they knew that they were naked. All of a sudden. Have you ever seen people who are no longer innocent? Their faces will tell you. Even Vegas, I want to sting this. Vegas, hi, hi. Koinda, why are you looking like this? Ah, but what's wrong? What's wrong with me? Their faces change. Their behaviors change. And I, I really want to help you here. Their behaviors change. If you have children, you know when they have just stolen the sugar. You know that. We raised one. We knew. I would tell Nomsa, I said, look, Nomsa, don't ever think that if you do wrong, I don't know it. I just have to look at you. And the mother would say, look, have you looked at Nomsa? I said, I have. Go and talk to her. <laughs> no, Mama, it wasn't, it wasn't really like that. It was, and then at the end, guess what? She, she's the first one to say, look, yeah, you are right. I ate your chocolates. Yeah, I knew it. I hadn't counted the chocolates. But I knew. Your face alone, it told me that there is something you've taken from me. And for sure, go and count my chocolates. They are two short, three short. And that was the problem. So they knew. They, 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 they were, so the Bible says, they were now naked. Ha, huh, you're now naked. What were you before? You were naked. Now, this is what innocence does. Innocence makes you continuously now, you overclothe yourself. 
Not, I'm not talking physical clothing, but you overclothe your character with all sorts of, because now you're no longer innocent. You're no longer vulnerable because you now have to cover up. You have now have to mask. You have to put more makeup. I'm told there's a challenge of makeup or no makeup out there in the social media. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you must put on your makeup and enjoy that. But they also tell me that the more makeup you put, it means you really have to mask a lot. Let me tell you, ladies, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, don't ever let makeup deceive you that, look, you'll be be more beautiful than the makeup. But put on the makeup so that you enhance your beauty. But that's not where your beauty comes from. It comes from God. It comes from God. And by accepting who you are. So Adam and Eve had to put on makeup now. I'm trying to be naughty. My mother is, is, is amazing on makeup. She, she really doesn't like makeup. Um, <laughs> so she always teases her sister, uh, his, uh, sisters-in-law. It says her daughters-in-law. So it says, ah, I'm not far I'm not She can't really say I don't like it, but... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so when we go and see, I always tease my wife and say, have you put on the lipstick? Because I really want my mother to know that you are not going to be changed by her saying, ah, Pana, but it's make up. No, Zora. Put it. Make it brighter. Say, hey, red, yeah, you know, I want to get out of far. So, Adam and Eve then decided that they would put on makeup. Because they were no longer innocent. Slippery slope. What did they do? They, they lost their creativity. They went and took fig leaves. Fig leaves. And guess what they did? They had to sow them. These were people who would co-create with God. And didn't need to even clothe themselves. Now they take perishable fig leaves. Mashija. They only last a day. That means that was the beginning of manual labor. Mangwana was watora yere mashija. Pane mashija yere pana. Inda ndisiru kona mashija. Kusenseni. It was it was mashija in the morning. There was a, there was they they began to to provide a space for mashija. If they would talk, what happened here? Now every shisha was shivering. Now we're going to be taking it to you next. Because every day, they now have to sow fig leaves. Capacity completely lost. Now guess what? Much of their day in the morning was caught up putting on fig leaves. How many of us are spending much of your day sowing fig leaves onto yourself? How many of you? How many of you? You count the eight hours and you just say, look, this was a fig leaves day. I've been trying to patch this, patch that, patch that, patch this, patch that. You are a fig leaves project yourself. Because you're just patching up. How many of us are doing that? That's loss of capacity. Business people. You spend time, three hours trying to dress in the morning. Ask the rich man of this world. Zuckerberg. Um, uh, um, the other guy who's Warren Buffett. Um, Bill Gates. And this one from um, South America, from Mexico, and um, all these other guys. You look at their routine in the morning. Shower, vaserine, t-shirt, jean, techies, gone. Hey, now let's talk about you. 
Let's talk about you. Now let's really talk about you. Let's take this deeper. You wake up what time? Let's just imagine what time you wake up. Let's be modest. You wake up at 6 o'clock. 5. And then you shower. Let's just give you a modest 15 minutes. You're done. But we know some can take a little longer. That's when the war begins. The fig, the fig leaves project begins after showering, after taking a bath. Two hours later. And after those two hours, guess what happens? You still haven't got there. I won't tell you what happens in my house. I want, still want to, because now I have no choice. I only stay with her. Uh, but when there were two of them, it was a fig leaves morning. <laughs> the one would be coming into a bedroom and says, how do I look? No, change the shoes. Goes back. After 20 minutes, brings back the same shoe but different dresses. But we say change the shoes. Okay, goes changes the shoes. Ch it's a fig leaves process. I won't even tell you what happened this morning. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. I won't tell you. I am not allowed. <laughs> but that's it. Then guess what happens? You are late for work. Forget church. You are now late for work. The rest of the world has been on the case. You will arrive at 9 o'clock. But the rest of the world started working at 6 o'clock. 7 o'clock. They are ahead of you. Fig leaves. And then, intimacy with God is lost. Our power is directly proportional to our intimacy with the authority that gives that mandate. So never expect to achieve much in your organization if you're not close enough with the authority that gives that mandate. Never expect to achieve much in life if you're not intimate with God who gives you the mandate for life. So, that's the power. The power you have is directly proportional. The more intimate you are, the more power you have. Now, the devil uses this in organizations. Therefore, we use the intimacy now falls into the sin category. Therefore, people are relating in an immoral way. But that principle is understood that you have to be close to the authority if you want to have more power. So it's lost. So if you want to change Zimbabwe, you can't change it by screaming from the streets the way you do, or tweeting, or writing on Facebook, or writing on... A, you have to be on an eyeball to eyeball to authority. That's the only way you're going to change. No amount of a <laughs> demonstration will cause authority to change their mind until somebody breaks in. Remember, it's biblical too. David was, uh, was oblivious to the fact that he had done something wrong until Nathan had to go into the chambers and say, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. And he tells a story about a man who had only one lamb. But afterwards, David responds and says, who's that man? And then Nathan said, you are the man. And the whole destiny of Israel was changed. Because there was somebody who was intimate with authority. If we want to make the turn and change our lot in our generation, we cannot be divorced from authority. We cannot. We have to get close to it. We cannot even scream at it. We have to draw it close to us. That way we will change it. 
That's the only way we're going to change it. It's biblical and it's, that's the only way. Jesus himself drew the 12 close to him so that they'll be able to express full authority in what they did. In fact, they went out and they came back and said, demons were shrieking. Everything was jumping up and down. You have no idea, Jesus. He says, no, <laughs> it's not about that. Just worry, concern yourself that your name is in the Lamb Book of Life. And that's where it should stop. So capacity was lost, but intimacy was lost. When you sin, you can't face the light. And you immediately lose your capacity because light gives you capacity. You cannot influence and change situations around through sinful ways. You have to bring about the light. That's the only thing that... Because before everything else, God created light because he is light. Capacity is relational. Ability to influence people in the territory that gives you is always relational. There is now a new source of authority for Adam and Eve. There's a new source. Genesis 3, verse 11 to 13. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, you gave to be with me. She gave me of the tree. Completely lost authority now. It's now a blame game. Where there is lost capacity and lost authority, guess what begins to happen? We all blame everybody else. So we blame our past. We blame the future. We blame who we are. We blame that we are our gender. We blame the country we are born in. We blame the leaders. We blame everybody else. There is no sense of taking ownership anymore. When capacity is lost, there is no capacity for responsibility. So if you find yourself blaming everybody else and never saying, look, I think I have a part to play in this mess. Ah, hey, city council, oh, ah. You, you have absolutely nothing positive to say about your environs. It means, guess who is the biggest person to be blamed for what has happened? It's you who's uttering. When you have lost capacity, you can never take responsibility. Therefore, you blame somebody else. You blame the world. As a country, we'll blame sanctions, colonialism. We'll blame uh, the, the ancestors. We, we'll blame everybody. We'll blame, we'll, but never come to say, look, what is my part? Is somebody who has capacity. Send me, O oh God, a man of unclean lips, dwelling amongst the people of unclean lips, yet I've seen the glory of the Lord Almighty. Are you there? Are you taking that up? So they start blaming the woman. Says, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent <laughs> deceived me and I ate. None. So both of them at that stroke lost the full capacity. They lost their will. They lost their rights and their life. And they blamed everybody else. When you lose your will, your rights, and your life, you blame everybody else because you have lost the capacity to move back on. So capacity is lost. Through sin, disobedience, and complacence, we lose capacity. We are rendered powerless. Saints, I want to stop here. Next week, we finish this, this journey. We need to understand how God had intended it for us how God wanted us to be, and how we lost it so willingly, so meticulously willingly. This was not an ambush. They didn't wake up and say, oh, by the way, oh, I just found myself. No, there was a discussion. There was a process. They allowed it. They gave in their will. They gave in their rights. They gave in their lives, and they lost everything, and it was willingly done. Capacity can be lost. None of us falls into sin by accident. We willingly do that.
We used to talk with our young people in Bari. So they find they've impregnated a lady. And I said, so what happened? He says, ah, Pastor, I just woke up the following day. I said, how do you wake up the following day? Did you not go to their place? Yes, I did. Did you not discuss this? We did. So how do you wake up the following day? You cannot wake up from sin. You willingly plot it. None of us steals by accident. I don't even know. No. You plot it. You deceive. You make the moves. Don't touch the devil yet at that time. Because you're a willing participant. Because the will is with you. The rights are with you. The freedom is with you. The life is with you. So you are not being threatened by a gun to say, look, if you don't steal, I'm going to kill you. No. You willingly do it. So, we're going to touch on how do you redeem them? How has God redeemed and given us full capacity? Next week, we'll talk about that. You and I, where we are today, as sons of God. When I mean sons here, is male and female. As sons of God. How have we been redeemed and how should we express our will, our rights, as well as our life in God? Let's stand. There are some people who are here and they've never given their lives to the Lord. You have never made a commitment. You, are, you still have your will to choose. And you still have the rights of your own freedoms. They are not in God yet. And you still have your life. In your, your life is in your hands. You can do whatever you want with your life. But maybe this is an opportunity for you to surrender your life. And so that you can walk with Jesus that you are redeemed, you are saved from sin, eternal damnation, eternal condemnation, that you are redeemed. Is there anybody here who says, look, hearing this message makes so much sense, but I don't have that life in God. I've never made that choice. I love what I hear. I'm blessed by what I hear. I could even use it at work. But let me tell you, this is about the source of life himself. Jesus, the Son of God, who died for you and I, that we may have life in Him. We lost that life in, in Adam and Eve. And some of us are still dead in our sins. We need to be alive in Jesus. Is there anybody out there say, look, I want, I want to make a decision for Jesus. I, I want, I, today He's found me. By coming here and being in this presence, God has found me. If you're there, just lift your hand wherever you are. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Put your hand down. Anybody else? Anybody else? This is your moment. You will never regret this. Some of us did it many years ago. We have never regretted our hearts and our lives in, are in God. Is there anybody else? Before I, 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 I close, is there anybody else saying, look, thank you very much. God bless you. Wow. Is there anybody else? Yes, is there anybody else? Those people who have raised their hands, I want you to come up front here. Come. I want to pray with you. Come. Come. I want to pray with you. Even those who haven't raised their hands, I want them to come up here.